Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel even better. We'll spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Do it. Okay. Do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. Anyway, this is the second of my in-depth series on New Zealand wine, or the sixth in the overall series. The first episode of this in-depth in series covered overall history, wine law, climate, soils, etc. This episode will cover the North Island, while the next will cover the South Island. These three episodes are going to be at a SOM school advanced level and will be intended for those of us studying for all levels of exams. With that said, I'll be using the Court of Master Sommeliers Europe's 2023 syllabus as my guideline on what to cover. I frequently call them the UK chapter because that's where they were founded, but they're officially called Europe. Like the other one is called Americas. Anyway, CMS Europe has yet to release their 2024 syllabus at the time of this, well, at the time I wrote the script in December. Now, you may ask, why not use the American chapter syllabus? Well, because it doesn't exist on the website, at least not the last time I checked. Something I and others have complained about the past few years. Either way, essentially the syllabus I'm using is valid for both sides of the pond. Now, I have an extensive list of links for this episode in the description. This list will probably be the same for all the episodes. I encourage you to explore further, especially the links directly related to this episode. While I tried to limit uh, to what the syllabus covers, I do include additional information for context or, well, just because I think it's kind of important to know for a professional lives, or which is kind of cool or interesting. All right, let's get into New Zealand's appellation system first. They are called Geographical Indications or GIs. Australia does the same. There are a total of 22 GIs in New Zealand. The GI system wasn't created until 2017. These are the equivalent to the EU's PGI or Protected Geographical Indication. Initially, there were 18 GIs that submitted applications to be included in the GI register at the Intellectual Property Office of New Zealand. In 2019, those initial 18 were finalized. Four more were then added since. All right, the Intellectual Property Office is the governmental agency that administers the GI system. So if you ever have a question about what's an official GI, you can go visit their site. I have a direct link to the list of GIs on their site. Now, what's really cool about the site is you can also download the official data file for each GI. These can be loaded into a program such as, well, what I use, Google Earth Pro, to visualize each GI. Longtime viewers of my show know I find being able to do this extremely valuable, and I've mapped many of the major countries, or at least most of the, most of the regions of each major country and the wine regions uh, over the world for the past three years. And I'm still not done. Unfortunately, most countries don't have this kind of resource available at all, so I've got to hand draw this stuff. Uh, so back to the GIs. First and foremost, New Zealand is a GI. Not every country actually includes itself as an appellation like that. Australia does, but South Africa is not listed in the wine of origin scheme. They like to use scheme a lot. However, uh, you could probably have a wine that just says product of South Africa, I guess. Most other countries are the same. There'll be some kind of legislation about what defines a wine from that country, but it's not part of the appellation system, like an AVA, an AOP, etc. Those will just be a table wine. So for instance, France is not an AOP. Um, it's a classification of table wine, Vin de France, or you know, so, but it's not, France is not an appellation per se. Now, I mention this because it's possible that you could get asked a question as basic as what's the largest GI in New Zealand? I actually had that happen at a competition. Uh, and the answer is, well, New Zealand. After that, North Island and South Island are also GIs. Let's break down the rest by island, north to south. So we have the North Island GI, and then within that we have Northland GI, Auckland GI, Matakana GI, Kumeo GI, Waiheke Island GI, Gisborne GI, Hawks Bay, you'll notice that you can either be an apostrophe S or no apostrophe S, uh, that's a GI, Central Hawks Bay GI, Wairapa GI.
Moving to the South Island, we have the South Island GI. Then within that, Nelson GI, Marlboro GI, Canterbury GI, North Canterbury GI, Waipara Valley or just Waipara GI, Waitaki North Otago, Waitaki Valley GI, so either one, then Central Otago GI, and then finally Bannockburn GI. First thing to mention, in Canterbury, while the Waipara Valley GI looks to be a subregion of North Canterbury, it's officially a subregion of Canterbury. That doesn't really make sense in the service, but it's probably due to when everything was approved. The North Canterbury GI was submitted on July 27, 2017, but wasn't accepted until March 13, 2020, and then not registered until June 29, 2020. Waipara Valley, while also being submitted on 7-27-2017, received this acceptance earlier on July 31st, 2018, and was registered on December 3rd, 2018. So technically Waipara Valley was first. So this could also be another tricky question. How many subregions does Canterbury have? Or Waipara Valley is a subregion of what GI or anything similar? Probably not, but you know, if you want to get like kind of really geeky, I guess you could have a question like that, maybe for a competition or something. Second, three of the GIs have alternative names. Not a big deal, but just pointing out that two have, that they have two acceptable names. Next, the obvious potential confusion between Wairapa on the North Island and Waipara on the South Island. I don't have any kind of trick to remember the difference other than just memorizing it. If you watched the first episode of the series and you saw the really nice map, the kick-ass one I got of Marlboro, it has three main regions mapped out, but those are not GIs. This is something to remember as we tend to talk about these regions often as if they are GIs. Just remember that so that you don't get tripped up being asked about GIs. Let's revisit one of the charts from earlier. Per the New Zealand Wine Growers website, here are the stats for the 2023 harvest by region. Northland has 73 hectares or 182 tons crushed. Auckland has 276 hectares or 709 tons crushed. Waikato or, or uh, Bay of Plenty, which is not a GI, uh, is 13 hectares and zero tons crushed. Gisborne is 1,300 or 10,967 tons crushed. Hawke's Bay, 4,805 hectares or 38,409 tons crushed. Wairapa is 1,089 hectares or 5,528 tons crushed. Marlboro is 29,654 hectares or 393,865 tons crushed. Nelson, 1,080 hectares or 11,472 tons crushed. Um, North Canterbury is 1,464 hectares or 11,090 tons crushed. In the stats, North they use North Canterbury rather than Canterbury. Uh, because really outside of the North Canterbury GI, there, there really aren't any vineyards. Um, then Central Otago, 2,054 hectares or 11,995 tons crushed. And Waitaki Valley is 54 hectares or 210 tons crushed. And then other, we don't really have a vineyard area, but there's 236 uh, tons crushed for a total of 41,860 hectares or 484,663 tons crushed. I'll be presenting acreage under vine numbers for each region as I get to them. Please note that they may not be exactly the same as what I just read, even though they should be coming from the same source. It's not that we don't need to know anything about GIs other than Marlboro, just that it's the most important. For example, I've had exam questions about other GIs. Let's start with the North Island. Northland is the farthest north, conveniently. This is where that monastery planted vines in 1819. It's a peninsula with no, with no part being more than 50 kilometers from the ocean. When I was almost finished writing this script, I stumbled upon the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, or NIWA, uh, their website's climate maps. Now, uh, so you'll see these for each region that I cover. The maps average 30 years of data from 1981 to 2012. So while they're a bit outdated, they, they still hold up. 
Northland's overall climate isn't quite subtropical, but it's the closest you'll find in the country. It has warm, humid summers and mild, wet winters. It has the highest average annual temperature of the country. Summers typically average around 22 to 26 degrees Celsius or 72 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Occasionally, it'll get up to 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hotter than that here. Um, anyway, winters right now, <laughs> winters will see highs of 13 to 19 degrees Celsius or 55 to 66 degrees Fahrenheit and lows of 6 to 11 degrees Celsius or 43 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, remember, these are all like average temperatures. There definitely can be extremes. You know, 100 degree temperatures were, are not, um, have happened and will happen in New Zealand, okay? Uh, annual rainfall is 1,500 to 2,000 millimeters or 59 to 79 inches. And sunlight hours are around 2,000 hours per year. Northland's topography is rolling hills and you have farming and forestry as the main industries here. Soils are, well, complex. According to the Northland Regional Council, there are over 320 soil types in Northland versus an average of like 20 in other regions. If you are a soil nerd, this is the website to check out, link below. And well, the part of New Zealand you probably should go check out. The basement rocks are a mixture of sedimentary, alluvium, volcanic, octothons, I, I think I messed that up, but rocks that moved during the low angle thrust faulting, um, and gray wacky. But the soils cover just about all types you'll find in the soil texture triangle of sand, clay, and silt. With 76 hectares of vineyards, they are sparse in the region, but tend to be clustered around Wangarai, the Bay of Islands, and Kaitaia. There are 10 wineries listed on the New Zealand Wine Growers website. Gilsom says there's 20 in 19, 2019. Uh, no matter the number, it's not a lot. There are four main grapes. Here is the breakdown per the New Zealand Wine Growers website. Chardonnay is 19 hectares, Syrah 14 hectares, Pinot Gris 11 hectares, Merlot 5 hectares, and then others, there's 21 other varieties that total 27 hectares. While Chardonnay is the most planted by only a few acres, apparently it's Syrah and Pinot Gris that are getting the most attention. Fertility is not a problem with the soils, so the growers have to deal with limiting the potential for high yields. The wines are usually ripe with lower acidity. Producers to make note of are... Kari Kari Estate, Okahu Estate, and Marsden Estate. Next down the North Island is Auckland. This is, funny enough, centered around Auckland, New Zealand's largest city. It is also the economic engine of the country. You'll find that it will also have winery, off, winery offices located here from the major brands. It is one of the oldest wine regions in New Zealand being established in the early 1900s. Auckland has three official subregions. Matakana GI, Kumeu GI, and Waiheke GI. There are also some unofficial GIs or unofficial regions. South Auckland, West Auckland, Clevedon, uh, Huapai, and Henderson. Soils are similar to Northland, but not as many different types. Throughout the subregions, you'll find volcanic and clay. Sandstone, mudstone, and silt are also common. Climate is maritime. Average sunlight hours are 2,060 hours and average rainfall is 1,240 millimeters or 49 inches. Let's break down each sub-GI a little further. First, Kumeu. Soils are fertile. The climate is warm and humid. Chardonnay and Merlot are the main varieties here. It is located not far from the western coast of Auckland. Matakana is on the mainland. Farther north uh, on the eastern coast, it is highlighted by rolling hills. Again, we have warm weather and lots of humidity. Pinot Gris and Syrah are the main varieties here. Waiheke Island is, well, an island, funny enough. It is located directly east of Auckland and is a fairly large island. It is also the only island GI, as in, well, it's not part of the, you know, as, as, as other than like, you know, North Island and South Island. Um, its climate is described as warm and dry by multiple sources. Syrah appears to be the main variety here, but other varieties such as Multipulciano, Petit Verdot, Chardonnay, and Viognier are apparently also doing well. With a total of 285 hectares under vine throughout all of Auckland, here are the top varieties. Chardonnay, 71 hectares. Syrah, 47 hectares. Pinot Gris, 34 hectares. Merlot, 33 hectares. Cabernet Franc, 18 hectares. Cabernet Sauvignon, 17 hectares. And then the other 30 varieties, are 65 hectares. 
Auckland is the center of wine commerce. As a result, there are a lot of wineries located here, either their main facility or some kind of administrative office. Some notable wineries that are physically located here are Babbage Wines New Zealand, Kumeu River Wines, Delegats Wine Estate, Cable Bay Vineyards, Stony Ridge Vineyard, Villa Maria Vineyard, Man o War Vineyards. You also find some wineries owned by Constellation here, though not all of them are actually located in Auckland. Rather, they may have a home office like aka Constellation's home office here. Uh, so Nobilo, Monkey Bay, and Kim Crawford. Another large company based here is Pernod Ricard NZ, New Zealand. They bought Montana wines, as I talked about last, last episode, in 2010, after it had been bought and sold a few times from 2001. Montana Wines was founded in 1961 and became New Zealand's largest wine producer. It bought the second largest, Corbin's Wines, in 2000. Corbin's was one of New Zealand's oldest wineries, having been established in 1902, also in Auckland. Montana Wines essentially merged with Brancott Estate, also owned by Pernod Ricard. In addition to Brancott, they also own Church Road Winery, Montana Gisborne Winery, Stonely, and Tamaki Winery. Their Dirt's Champagne House, but that's how you pronounce it, it's Dirt's, not Dutes. Their Dirt's Champagne House also has a winery here, or at least does a collaboration. It's probably made at the Montana Winery under the Dirt's name. Now, many people will cover the next two regions south, Waikato Bay and Bay of Plenty, but these are not GIs, as I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, but they do have a small amount of vineyards here, 13 hectares. No wineries are located here, however. Just know, it's probably why they don't have any tons crushed. Um, just know that the areas exist, and well, that's really about it. Moving on, we have Gisborne. This is considered the easternmost wine-growing region in the world. It is also where Captain Cook first landed. You may also see this region referred to as Poverty Bay. Gisborne does not have any official sub-GIs, but you may hear people talk about the following unofficial sub-regions. Hexton Hills or Golden Slope, Ormond Valley, Central Valley, River Point, Patutahi Plateau, and Waipaoa. There are three subregions, though, that seem to be the most important. These could be future sub GIs Ormond, Patutahi, and Manutuke. This region was known for growing a lot of low quality Muller Turgau in the mid 20th century. Then, in the 1980s, these vines began getting pulled in favor of Chardonnay, Vignang, and Versameter. The climate here is drier than much of the rest of the country due to the hilly terrain to the west providing protection from the prevailing winds from the west. It gets an average of 2,180 sunlight hours and an average rainfall of 1,051 millimeters or 41 inches. Rainfall is higher to the west. Most, if not all, the vineyards are concentrated near the town of Gisborne, which is on Poverty Bay, hence the alternative name. The surrounding hills provide that extra protection from the west. The Waipaoa River runs through the valley containing all of the aforementioned unofficial subregions. The Rao Kumara Range is what provides that protection from the west. Soils are a mixture of alluvial silt near the river and heavier clay loam as you move away from the river. Montana Wines, Penfolds, you know, one from Australia, and Corbin's built wineries here in the 1960s and 70s as part of the bulk wine industry. Montana still maintains a large facility here. Other than these wineries, there are a couple to pay attention to, Brunton Road Wines and Milton Vineyards and Winery. Chardonnay's king here with Pinot Gris and Sauvignon Blanc rounding out the top three. With a total of 1,245 hectares, the most so far in our tour, it ranks about fifth in acreage under vine. Now here are the main grapes. Chardonnay is 582 hectares, Pinot Gris has 288 hectares, Sauvignon Blanc 250 hectares, Merlot 24 hectares, Gerarsimeter, 19 hectares, and 17 other varieties at 82 hectares. Next, we have Hawke's Bay. It is considered New Zealand's oldest wine region. Not because this is where the first vines were planted, that was elsewhere, but this is where the first commercial vines were planted. As I mentioned earlier, vineyards were planted here in 1851 by Morris missionaries for communion wine and would become Mission Estate. This first location was in Pakowai. In 1858, they moved, like literally moved buildings to another area, Mini. And in 1870, the mission recorded its first commercial sale of wines. It is one of the largest wineries in Hawke's Bay. Operations then moved once again in 1909, including splitting up their La Grande Maison, the, the, the big house, into 11 separate pieces and physically moving it to its current location in Taradale. 
The climate here is sunny and its, quote, heat summations, as described by the New Zealand Wine Growers textbook, is somewhere between Burgundy and Bordeaux. In other words, they get an average of 2,180 hours of annual sunshine. Rainfall is 1,051 millimeters or 41 inches. Uh, by the way, this online textbook is absolutely fantastic. I've linked to their learning page for it rather than the actual textbook as it looks like it may be updated each year with information, especially acreage under vine figures. I use this extensively for this episode and I highly suggest you read it as I only pulled the highlights from it. This is true for all the links to the sources I used. There are other great educational resources on the learning page of that website, so check it out. Anyway, yes, the climate is moderated by the ocean, as most of New Zealand is, with hot summer days and, long growing, and a long growing season. Temperatures range from 22 to 25 degrees Celsius, or 72 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit for highs in the summer, and 6 to 8 degrees Celsius, or 43 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit for lows in the winter. Mountainous terrain surrounds almost the entire area and provides protection from the westerly winds. However, frost is more likely to occur f the farther inland you go. Cooler, wet weather can occasionally create problems during the growing season, but most of the soils drain easily. Speaking of soils, the area has over 25 different types of soils. These include clay loam, limestone, sand, free-draining gravel, and red metal or iron oxides. There are several major rivers here. Most sources say there are four, while a few say five. Now, depending on who's counting and which ones they are naming here, all the rivers that would be considered major from north to south are Wairoa River, Mohaka River, Esk River, Tutaikuri River, Ngaru Oro River, and Tukituki River. I like that. I like how it sounds. Um, though the Ngaru Oro River, that one was so hard to say and I'll probably mess it up again. That was hard. Anyway, also from Wikipedia, the Hawke's Bay region includes the hilly coastal land around the northern and central bay, the floodplains of the Wairoa River in the north, the wide fertile Haratonga plains around Hastings in the south, and the hilly interior stretching up into the Kaiweka and Ruhine ranges. The prominent peak Taraponui is located inland. Man, I, I, I apologize to any native uh, New Zealanders if I'm really butchering the names. I, am, I really am trying to get them right uh, and trying them multiple times, honestly. Hawke's Bay is commonly divided, at least for our purposes, into five areas. Coastal areas, hillsides, alluvial plains, river valleys, central Hawke's Bay. This is the only actual official sub-GI in Hawke's Bay, by the way. The coastal areas include Esk Valley and Te Awanga. This is where you'll have the most influence from Hawk Bay. Interesting that the bay is Hawk and the region is Hawks. Of course, then we have the apostrophe S or no apostrophe S too. It's temperate here and has a long growing season. There are gravelly soils in Bayview in the Northern Esk River Valley. Chardonnay, early ripening reds, especially Pinot Noir, are the main grapes here. The alluvial plains has the most variation in soils. This area was greatly shaped by the four or five major rivers, not including the Tukituki River. You'll find gravel beds, free draining alluvial soils, and stony terraces. This area contains gimlet gravels and the Bridge Paw Triangle. These are considered the source of some of the region's best wines. You'll find a wide variety of varieties here. The hillsides are in what appear to be three different parts of Hawke's Bay. In the south, there is North Havelock, which also has an area called Havelock Hills. Mare Cacao is to the west along the Ingaroro River and Bayview to the north on the coast. The textbook mentions that the hills provide frost protection. However, we also know that farther inland you go, aka Mare Cacao area, there is a higher chance of frost. However, each area is hilly. These, are, these areas focus on red varieties. Next are the river valleys. Pretty self-explanatory. This area is formed by the four major rivers of Wairoa River, Mohaka River, Tukakuri River, and the Ngaru Oro River, stretching from the sheltering ranges in the west to Hawk Bay in the east. A variety of soils, altitude, and aspect is found here. Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, and Pinot Noir appear to be the main varieties. Central Hawke's Bay, the only official sub-GI, is the entire south portion of Hawke's Bay. Yeah, it's called Central, but it's really in the south. Explain that one. I'm, I'm sure someone can. 
Anyway, while it does include the coast, the vineyards are inland and at an elevation of about 300 meters or 984 feet. These vineyards are in, the, in a cooler area. Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, and Pinot Noir show the most potential here. As I mentioned earlier, this is the home of the famous and trademarked Gimlet Gravels. I've linked to the organization's webpage, so definitely check it out. This is arguably the most important non-GI area in Hawks Bay, along with the Bridge Paw Triangle. I'll cover them next. So the main feature here is the soil, composed of gravel. The base rock is gray wacky. This is in Gimlet Gravels. Uh, gray wacky was formed over hundreds of millions of years from the high temperatures and pressures that cause sand grains to weld together to form a hard sandstone called gray wacky. I'm pretty sure I got that from the Gimlet Gravels website. Five million years ago, uplifting due to tectonic plate movement, created the Wairau, Ka Kaweka, and Ruahine ranges. In the western portion of the region, aka the mountainous areas, the Wairau is the source of the Wairora River. The Kaweka range is the source of the Esk, Mohaka, and the Tukakuri, and the Ungar Oro rivers. And the Ruahine range is the source of the Tukituki River. Whew. All right. Wetting, drying, heating, and cooling of the exposed rock along with gravity caused the rock to break off into the streams and rivers. These were then deposited to the plains to the east. We see this primarily in the central plains along the Tukakuri and the Ungaroro rivers. The Ungaroro river is the river that has the most vineyards in the GI. The Gimlet Gravels district soils are comprised of a fine sand to a fine loamy topsoil overlying stony gravels mixed with different proportions of sand and non-stony sand between the stony layers. The topsoils are divided into three phases. Phase one is three to 10 centimeters of fine sand. Phase 1A is five to 10 centimeters of brown loamy fine sand over five to 10 centimeters of gray fine sand. And then phase 1B is 15 to 20 centimeters of brown loamy fine sand over 10 to 15 centimeters of gray fine sand. Did you get all that? Yeah, I, I, I probably have a picture of that. Hopefully I did. Besides the soil, this area is one of the driest and warmest of Hawks Bay. The protection of the western mountainous region combined with it being 15 kilometers inland give it increased sunlight hours and heat. Part of the heat is absorbed by the exposed gravel, allowing the vines to stay warmer for longer at temperatures that promote the ripening process. While not exactly at the Galais Roulets of Chateauneuf de Pop, nor is warm, the gravel does retain the summer sun in a similar fashion as the soils of Chateauneuf de Pop. This allows the growing of Bordeaux varieties along with Syrah. While there are several wineries based here, or at least sourced from here, Pasque was the first to plant vineyards. Stonecroft is another winery that is important to the area. 90% of the land is planted to red varieties. Merlot, 35%, Syrah, 20%, Cabernet Sauvignon, 15%, Malbec, 7%, Cabernet Franc, 4%, and then the others will include Grenache, Multipulciano, and Tempranillo at 19%. While maybe not as famous or at least not as well marketed or trademarked, on the southern border of Gimlet Gravels is the Bridge Paw Triangle Wine District. They have what is called Ingatara Gravels, a sandy loam over gravel. The other soil types are Takapau, also a sandy loam over gravel, and Te Awa, a clay loam on pumice sand. Essentially, these soils are free-draining red metal gravels overlaid by alluvium derived from less volcanic ash and gray wacky. The area gets a lot of sunshine and low rainfall, well, low for New Zealand. They get about the same number of degree days as Bordeaux, which is around 2900 on the Winkler scale, making it a region two, uh, which is anywhere between 2501 to 3000 degrees, uh, 3000 uh, Fahrenheit degree days, or 1389 to 1667 uh, Celsius degree days. The most planted varieties planted here are Merlot at 337 hectares, Chardonnay at 200 hectares, Syrah at 151 hectares, and Sauvignon Blanc at 126 hectares. So you'll notice I had percentages in hectares that's just because that's how the websites for these two areas broke it down. Um, so I just used that instead of trying to put it all the same. Central Hawks Bay is to the south, and that's about all I got. It appears that all of the attention is in Hawks Bay proper, if you will, to the north and mostly centered in the main river plains. There doesn't even appear to be a website for wineries or vineyards in central Hawks Bay. Just know it exists. 
Hawke's Bay is the second largest region in terms of production at 4,786 hectares. The following varieties are planted here. Chardonnay at 1,060 hectares, Sauvignon Blanc at 1,011 hectares, Merlot at 975 hectares, Pinot Gris at 676 hectares, Syrah at 343 hectares, Pinot Noir at 223 hectares, Cabernet Sauvignon at 183 hectares, and then there's 31 other varieties with 315 hectares planted. Major producers to know for the entire region are Craggy Range, Esque Valley Estate, Mission Estate, Sacred Hill, Seleni, Tamata, and Trinity Hill. There are a lot of other producers here, but also realize that a lot of producers just source from here. I don't think I've already mentioned this, but most of the larger wineries source from all over the country. Some even have production facilities throughout the country in addition to their main winery. The last region in North Island is Wairapa. This is a good time to talk about wine regions versus administrative regions. For the most part, the New Zealand GI system follows the exact same boundaries as New Zealand's regional administrative units. That's held true so far, well, until now. Wairapa is in the Wellington region named after New Zealand's capital city of Wellington. So it's not Auckland, it's not Christchurch. Wellington is the capital city. The Wairapa GI comprises the eastern three districts of Wellington, Masterton, and Carrotton, and South Wairapa. So it still follows the system of mirroring administrative boundaries, just not the entire region administratively. We'll see this again on the South Island. The name Wairapa means, quote, glistening waters in Maori. They call themselves the small and mighty wine region. I can have respect for a strong ego, not being egotistical or cocky, just confident. In terms of acreage under vine, they are going to be either sixth or seventh, depending on the year. Nelson is right on their heels. Vines were first planted here in 1883, but a short 22 years later, the temperance movement wiped them out. And uh, it wasn't until the relaxation of these laws in the 1970s when production resumed in Martinborough by the producers Dry River, Martinborough Vineyard, and Atarangi. And Shifney, now known as Margraine. The region gets about 1,915 sunlight hours and an average annual rainfall of 979 millimeters or 39 inches. So we still see a significant amount of rain here. The climate is classified as semi-maritime. The Tarua ranges along the western part of Wellington provide protection from the westerlies, but they also create a phone wind described as, quote, blustery and devigorating. All right, devigorating is normally used in conjunction with pruning or selecting rootstocks. The reason I know because I, I looked it up. I want to know what devigorating actually meant. Some rootstocks are less vigorous than others. In this context, as in the wind, I'm not sure if they're referring to the wind essentially blowing off flowers or leaves or having a drying effect. But yes, a phone wind can be devigorating to vines. Also remember that these winds are typically hot as they gain energy as they go down the mountains. Spring and autumn will be cool while summer will be hot, but have cool nights. This large diurnal shift adds in the retention of, of acidity, and not that Sauvignon Blanc really needs any help with it. This also ends up extending the growing season. This area's climate is also conducive to late harvest and botrycized bot wines. Rain doesn't happen during harvest time, so you have a long, dry autumn. Wairapa has three main subregions, Martinborough, Gladstone, and Masterton. There is also an area called Opaki, just north of Masterton. It could be its own area, a part of Masterton, depending on who's defining the area. Of these areas, really only Martinborough and Gladstone are GIs. The others are not. Just remember that you may hear about these areas. There are also vineyards between the GIs and the mountains, along with other types of agriculture. All these regions essentially have similar climates and soils, though the farther inland, the less maritime inf influence there is. Soils predominantly silt over loam over free draining gravels. These can be as deep as 15 meters or 49 feet. Like in Hawke's Bay, we have the deposit of gray wacky rocks from the Taraua ranges becoming the gravel through alluvial deposits. Masterton is where grapes were first planted and is the largest town in Wairapa. Early morning frost is common, but the summer can be quote, incredibly hot. Average summer highs are around 24 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is possible to have highs as high as 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. As far as soils, in and around Masterton, the gravel riverbeds will also contain limestone. 
Gladstone, just to the south of Masterton, will be cooler as we are getting closer to the ocean. Soils in Gladstone become more variable, stony silt loam with clay pockets. They also are said to have free-draining river terraces like in Martinborough. I'll cover that in a second. This soil suits Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc very well. Martinborough is south of Gladstone. Climate is cooler here as we are even closer to the ocean. Temperature-wise, we are similar to Burgundy. In Martinborough, you also have river terraces. These are part of a shallow escarpment along the Huangarua River. An escarpment is defined as, quote, a steep slope of long cliff that forms as a result of faulting or erosion and separates two relatively level areas having different elevations. While Gladstone has river terraces, Martinboroughs are better known and more prominent. Along the river, there are two distinct elevations by about 10 to 50, 10 to 50 meters, or 33 to 164 feet. There are, quote, act there are, there are actual walks you can do. For price, of course, there'll be links below for that. The soils in Martinborough and the mini valley of Temuna along the Huangarua River are, quote, highly sought after. Pinot Noir excels here, as expected, given the similarity to Burgundy. Sauvignon Blanc and Syrah, kind of surprising to me at least, are also of high quality here. I shouldn't be, Syrah does, you don't need hot climate for Syrah. You can, you can do Syrah in cooler climate areas. I can attest to the Pinot Noir, at least from Escarpment Winery that I've had. It's pretty delicious. Notable producers include Adirangi Vineyard and Winery, Dry River Wines, the aforementioned Escarpment Winery, Margrain Vineyard, Martin Burrow Vineyard, Palliser Estate Winery. A total of 1,090 hectares are under vine here. These are the most plentiful varieties. Pinot Noir at 527 hectares, Sauvignon Blanc at 394 hectares, Chardonnay at 62 hectares, Pinot Grief at 47 hectares, and then another 23 varieties at 60 hectares. And that's the end of the North Island and the end of today's show. Next episode, we'll cover the South Island. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we will see you next time.